Hello everyone, this is going to be the part 4 video lecture for inductive arguments, the inductive arguments module, and strap in because this is going to be a big long one, so just get ready. Um, this will be a long video, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, in this video I'm planning to talk about an argument form called inference to the best explanation. And I'm actually very excited about giving this lecture, this is one of my favorite lectures from the whole quarter to give, um, for, for a bunch of reasons. I think um, one, there's just a lot of cool things to like keep an eye out for with this, but um, inference to the best explanation is <clears throat> an argument form that we're constantly using. Just, I mean, constantly. Once we learn it, once once you see how it's working, uh, I think you'll see all these places that it shows up. And But it, it happens a lot of the times implicitly. We're not usually thinking in terms of inference the best explanation as like a, a conscious reasoning process or a thought process. Um, but it's actually a huge, huge part of inductive reasoning, so much so that there are some philosophers, and this is a more extreme view, so I'm not like this isn't do philosophical dogma or something, but um, there are some philosophers who want to argue that all inductive reasoning is actually inference the best explanations. You know, we've been learning all these different models of how induction can happen, what inductive, what inductive arguments can look like. Um, there's some philosophers who want to argue that it's actually all inference the best explanation deep down. Now, like I said, that's a controversial view, but the fact that it's even a plausible option um, is a testament to how uh, common this reasoning is. The other thing that's interesting about inference the best explanation is that um, you remember when we, we were doing um, statistical generalizations and applications, and then even when we were doing um, causal reasoning too, I was saying like, this might look kind of familiar in terms of what you think of as science, of like how scientists work. Maybe they, you know, they go out, they do some surveys and, and investigate, run some experiments, make some generalizations. You know, that's something scientists do. They also collect a bunch of, uh, they run a bunch of experiments, collect data, and start looking for patterns in that data to speculate about what might be causal laws, and it was like with the causal reasoning section. But inference to the best explanation um, flies under the radar a lot of times. That's actually a huge, huge part of how science is done. It's just the kind of, the, the part of science that's not as well known or that um, people don't get exposed to quite as often. Um, I've, I've sort of mentioned a couple times before, I've, I got a little bit of an axe to grind about the uh, the kind of um, absolute infallibility that we sometimes give to scientific sources when no scientist is going to claim that on their own accord for what they're doing. Um, science in, is inductive, it's empirical, and it only has inductive arguments to offer, and, and that always is fallible, and that's a, that's a part of how science works and what we're doing when we're doing science. And it's, a, it's something we accept and move on from, rather than pretending like it's infallible, but um, you know, we've got, sometimes we can, there, there's a tendency we have to watch out for about fetishizing data or statistics. I've kind of mentioned this in some previous lectures, but um, I think one reason why inference the best explanation can fly under the radar a little bit is that it's a little more obviously um, fallible. Um, it's, uh, it's, a little, it's a little different pattern of reasoning um, that doesn't quite allow you to believe or operate under the illusion that the evidence is providing absolute certainty for what is taking place. And the reason for this is not that inference the best explanation doesn't deal with evidence. It does deal with evidence, but it deals with evidence in a different way. Um, it deals with like observational evidence in a different way than some of the other argumentative forms that we've looked at, <clears throat> or at least on the surface. And, you know, we've still got these philosophers who are like, maybe it's all inference the best explanation deep down. Might still be true, but... Um, but at least on the surface, this looks like a different pattern. I'm going to teach it as a different pattern of reasoning with its own different set of criteria. And that's one of the reasons this lecture will be so long, is that uh, there are seven of them. <laughs> I'll show you, show you. There are seven standards here. Um, this, this first one I like to call story to tell. We'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, depth, power, falsifiability, modesty, simplicity, and conservativeness. These are all things... Um, that we're going to care about for inference, the best explanation. Um, so there's a lot to lot to do here. So dig in, um, but we'll we'll get cracking here. So our definition here for inference, the best explanation, is an argument for a claim. 
that cites that claim's ability to explain something that we observe or believe in a way that is better than any competing explanations. So I want to kind of, well, we can draw some pictures here about what's going on with inference, the best explanation and the structure of it. But the key idea here is that an in inference of the best explanation, I'm citing a, um, a sort of a hypothesis, if you will. I'm citing a hypothesis ability to explain something as my reason for believing it. So it's explanatory usefulness is my reason for believing that it's true. And I've actually, I've had some debates with some uh, colleagues of mine who are, are very suspicious of inference, the best explanation. you got some philosophers on one side that are like, everything's inference, the best explanation. And then you've got these other philosophers who are like, it's irrational. It makes no sense. And the ones that really don't like it, um, the criticisms I've heard is, um, is that it's kind of like rational wishful thinking, <laughs> if you will. I mean, it's kind of like, man, it would be really nice if we could be able to explain this. So we'll endorse this belief because it allows us to do this explanatory work. And on that level, it you know doesn't look very good for inference the best explanation if you're thinking of it as as kind of like wishful thinking. I mean, that that sounds bad, right? But um, this this kind of ability to explain things is maybe one of the core features of just how rationality works at all in any situation. That's another uh, thing I like to, to talk about with this. Uh, there, are, there are so many cool philosophical tangents I could be going on with inference, the best explanation. I'm going to try to be good and not do too many of them. But um, here, here's one, one other one before we, we actually dive into the, the nitty gritty of inference, the best explanation. So a uh, very famous philosopher, Immanuel Kant, kind of totally turned the um, philosophical world on its head uh, with his critique of pure reason. This is a hugely influential work. Um, and I think in some ways we're still feeling, um, we still haven't completely absorbed all of the legacy of what Kant's ideas. I mean, he, <clears throat> he threw a big stone in the pond and um, there's still, there's a lot of philosophers today who are like, yeah, Kant, Kant's wrong. He's wrong about all this stuff. Personally, I'm, I'm a little bit of a bigger fan of him, but um, here, here's what's relevant about it. Kant wanted to know what made all knowledge possible. There's this, I've mentioned before the, the problem of induction that David Hume came up with, and um, Kant wanted to solve the problem of induction. He wanted to basically save the rationality of science from the skeptical threats through these skeptical objections to the rationality of, of scientific reasoning, and Kant wanted to save this as actually rational. So to do that, he really, he, in many ways, I think he can be credited with pioneering the field of cognitive science, because he, he um, was one of the first philosophers to think about cognition as a kind of um, functional system, that if thought was going to be possible, some things had to happen to make it possible. Even, and by thought, I mean experience, anything that you experience, anything that happens in consciousness. Um, there's something that's sort of behind the scenes of it. I mean, we talk, the idea of a subconscious is not a foreign idea to people today. Um, but it was kind of a big deal. Like when Freud's talking about the subconscious, that was a big deal for people. To, and Freud did not invent it. <laughs> He's getting it from other philosophers like uh, Kant, actually, and, and in a l much less sophisticated way, actually, than, than how Kant breaks this all down. But Kant saw that one of the, that the kind of um, essential function that rationality performs is unifying experiences. You know, we're not like, uh, you know, this metaphor, our, our, our life, our conscious life is not like um, uh, similar to the metaphor of, of a movie. You know, when you've got film on a reel and it's, you know, projecting a film, you go to a movie theater and watch a film, it's showing you a bunch of still images like flash, 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 flash. We don't work like that. Consciousness isn't like that for us. Think when you're watching the film, you don't see flash, 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 flash. You see smooth motion. And your mind is putting those together. It's putting these flash moments and unifying them together in order to be able to think about them. And the same thing is true with all aspects of cognition, according to Kant, that when I've got a concept, when I think of in terms of a concept like 
even something like water. I've got the concept of water, really basic stuff, or a cup. That concept allows me to take a bunch of very different and diverse experiences and bring them together and unify them. Um, and this is one thing that explanation does. Kant famously argues that um, causal realities, like causal powers, causes and effect and the, and the laws that govern them, are actually not in the world on its own. There's something that we project onto the world in order to make it intelligible to us, to be able to make sense of it and to think about it. There's, this is a big rabbit hole. If you want to ask me about this sometime and talk more about Kant, you know, click here to learn more. You know, let me know. I'd love to talk about it. Um, but the cool idea here is that Kant thought, when I had, if I have any experience of any object under any circumstances, it doesn't matter universally, if I have any object of experience at all, I'm always asking questions about what is its cause and what, it, what is its effect. That's a universal sort of uh, rational demand that I put onto an object in order to make it even possible for me to think about it, for me to conceptualize a discrete object, Kant thought, required me to make judgment. And even if I don't know what is the cause, I make the judgment that there is a cause. I, it's like a little, um, I, I'm, I usually use this picture when I'm drawing on the board in class of like a box that has like handholds on it. So any object you've got always has a handhold for it to be connected with something else as a cause of it and something else that's an effect of it. And that's something that we project onto experience. And it's not wrong for us to do so, Kant says, because in order for us to be able to think about experience at all, we need to be able we need to project that onto it so it's kind of a formal necessary rational condition of thought so explanation for Kant is big that I'm, I'm and I use explanation as a way to unify my experiences Kant thinks um, if I have any ex experience at all like I hear a noise I hear I see a flash I'm like what caused that there must be something right and I'm constantly trying to make sense of this and and I when I'm if we're talking about science again if I'm if I'm a scientist and I'm trying to have an, have an understanding of why the world is the way that it is, what I'm looking for is an explanation. Um, predictions and explanations kind of go hand in hand here. Although those are a little, there are some differences there that we can talk about when it comes to philosophy of science again. There's a lot of things to mention, but um, this is why um, explanation might be a big deal and why inference is the best explanation, even though it kind of looks maybe weak as an argument, uh, as an argument model, um, as a way to try to defend a, a claim, uh, it's actually something that we're doing constantly, and it may even be everything that we're doing. Here, here's one more example. Um, the field of science that I'm most familiar with is cognitive science. That's uh, cognitive science is this interdisciplinary field between philosophers and psychologists and neuroscientists and and all these different researchers, um, and it's, I always like to say about it that it's it's a baby science. It's it's infantile. We're it's, it doesn't have its feet under it yet. Um, a lot of the debates and disputes that happen are how we should even go about researching the mind. Like what what is the research program that we should be operating under? Even that is controversial. So there's a lot of work that we're doing. There's a lot that we don't know. And almost every argument that is being offered right now in cognitive science based on evidence, remember again, this is a different way of relating to evidence, is really an inference of best explanation argument. All of them are inference of best explanation. So enough yapping about all this background and context and stuff. Let's take a look at, at what's actually happening. So we already got this idea that inference of best explanation is citing a claim's ability to explain something as a reason to believe that it's true. So um, and this is let's let's go back to now the role of evidence. What is what is what's um what's an empirical observation doing in this argument? Well, it's one of the premises. So I've got uh, I'm just gonna do some drawing here. So I got uh, oops I've got some observations, and this is like the empirical evidence that I have the evidence. I, I know some stuff is true um, based on observation, uh, and there's not really any question about this. Uh, it could get questioned, and then the argument would fall apart because, again, this is a premise, so if it's false, then there goes the argument. 
But let's grant for a second that this is true. And I'll actually use the case of cognitive science as, a, uh, as an example. So there's some, uh, some basic observations that we have. Maybe um, an fMRI scan about like what parts of the brain are lighting up when someone's doing math. Or the observation could be as simple as just like people do math. <laughs> I mean like that this is a cognitive ability that we have. Then uh, there's another premise. The premise, this premise will say, um, the uh, hypothesis in question is capable of explaining the observations. And then I'm going to put this one in italics, actually. Better than any other competing um, hypothesis. And that phrase there that I put in italics is super important. Okay, and then the conclusion is the hypothesis is true. Okay, so let's get our little line here, and I don't have my therefore symbol made, so I'm just going to monkey one up here. Meow, meow, meow. Okay, so two premises, a very simple argument in terms of how it's structured here. Um, we have some observations, we know something is true, like people do math. And then uh, I've got some theory I'm trying to defend is true, like a, a cognitive science theory about what's going on in the mind that allows us to perform mathematical functions. So I've got a way of explaining my, th I've got this uh, model of the mind, my cognitive science theory, which give, allows me to make an explanation of how we're capable of doing mathematics better than any other of the theories of mind that are out there um, that also try to explain or, or, or offer something to explain how we're capable of performing mathematical uh, calculations. So you can tell that things are going to get really complicated really fast because that claim that the hypothesis gives a better explanation than any other competing hypothesis, that's going to be hard to maintain in argument. And that's why in cognitive science, I mean, sometimes you get papers floating around, but more often than not, the stuff you got to read is like a whole book. Because to make the case, to make the argument for a certain theoretical model, you have to look at all the other models that are on offer that people have been arguing for and make the case that yours, your theory is giving the best explanation of all of them. Um, for the phenomenon that we're, we're here to explain. And when it comes to cognitive science, there's a lot of things we want to explain. How we're able to do math, how we're able to use language, how we're able to track time, um, how does sensation work, like how are we able to uh, have conscious experiences from like based on signals that are coming from photoreceptive cells in the back of your retina. I mean, how do we even think in terms of concepts? I could go on and on about cognitive science. <clears throat> there's a lot to explain. And there's a lot of theories on offer, and no one had when when something comes out like an fMRI scan, or uh, an experiment is is done. Um, it doesn't mean like a more a, a certain um, cognitive theory has now been proven correct. And when people talk that way, it drives me up the wall. When it, as as a cognitive scientist, because that's not how the arguments are using evidence. There's no way that you could. Um, argue using just you know fMRI scans of what parts of the brain are lighting up as proof that the mind works a certain way. It still is giving evidence, but only because maybe that piece of evidence, that, that fMRI scan, can be best explained by one theory versus the other competing theories. That's the way in which you'd really make an argument here. Um, but a lot of stuff that we're speculating about the mind and how consciousness works is not as simple as me checking my pockets to see how many coins do I have in them. We just don't get to do that. If we're like, how do concepts work? We can't just be like, well, I don't know. Let's crack open someone's head and find out. It doesn't work that way. And that's what I, uh, that's my transition and the next thing to talk about here when it comes to inference the best explanation. When do we use this? We use inference the best explanation when we're speculating about things that we can't directly observe. Um, say, for instance, um, a murder happens. This is going to be another case I'm going to use. And the detectives show up on the scene of the crime. 
and they're looking at the evidence of what's going on here. They don't have direct evidence for who committed the crime. If they had maybe a like camera that recorded the whole thing, or maybe an eyewitness testimony, that could maybe work. Um, and you don't have to rely on something like inference to the best explanation in order to make an argument for who is the culprit. Just be like, let's just look at the videotape. We'll find out. Boom, right? I, I mean, things can get more complicated, and, and maybe it'll turn into an inference of the best explanation argument because of the complications. But it's it's these cases where we can't just look and observe and find out what's up. Um, we didn't have a camera set up at the birth of our universe, you know, like Big Bang time. We didn't have a camera to confirm that the Big Bang is correct, but we can create a pretty decent hypothesis about what was going on based on the ability of that hypothesis to explain the things we can observe. Like maybe you've heard some of the arguments for the Big Bang big, based on things like background radiation that we can't observe right now. We're like, oh, there's all this background radiation in the universe. That is evidence that the Big Bang happened and happened in a certain way based on the ability of the Big Bang hypothesis to be able to explain what happened. Yeah, I don't want to get into all this stuff about Big Bang controversies and stuff right now too, but just the point is that inference of the best explanation is the kind of argument we have to rely on when we don't have direct observational evidence to decide the matter for us. So what we do is we take the stuff we can observe and see what sort of realities is that suggesting. And this is going to be a very fallible process, and you'll see as we're evaluating uh, an, an explanation um, just how many factors go, go into this. But here's another thing I want to warn you about. Or, or this is actually not a warning as much as a like, maybe a few for you. On the exam, because of the complicatedness of inference the best explanation, I will not have you actually evaluating a full inference the best explanation. Because again, to be able to tell whether this argument is a good one requires you to be able to see, uh, to one, evaluate the hypothesis in question for how good of an explanation it is. But then we also have to look at all the other competing hypotheses to figure it out. That's a pain. And there, are, there is an exercise in the homework that gets you to think about competing hypotheses and what other hypotheses could be offered to explain something. Um, but I'm not going to have you do that on the exam. All I'm going to ask you to do on the exam, and there's actually only going to be one IBE problem because it takes so long to do this stuff. I'm just going to ask one problem about IBE. I'm going to um, give you a case where someone is um, basically arguing for a hypothesis on, based on its ability to explain some observations. And all I want you to do is evaluate for me that one explanation. Just tell me whether it's a good explanation or a bad one based on the criteria that we use for telling what is a better explanation and what's a, and what's a worse one. So you're not going to have to do a comparison of one hypothesis versus a competing hypothesis, and thus you won't be actually evaluating a full inference the best explanation. But you are going to be learning the standards that you can use as a tool to engage in this kind of reasoning and evaluating this style of argument. So I'm giving you all the tools and I'm going to test you on those tools, but I'm not going to ask you to write a whole paper on comparing different hypotheses and evaluating them. That'd be it'd be a ton of work, and I'm not, and 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 we're, we're, I just I'm not, not going to force you to do that. You're welcome. Um, okay. So what are the standards here for evaluating um, a good uh, inference of the best or a, an explanation? How do we evaluate a good explanation? Well, the first thing that we should talk about. I'm, I'm going to draw a map, and I think this map is very useful. Um, like I was saying, there's seven there's seven different standards here, and I'll be expecting you to talk about all seven of them uh, on the exam when you have to do this explanation evaluation thing. Um, so they, And then some of them are easy to mix up, and, I, and so I got this drawing, I got this diagram that I think is going to help a lot in helping you keep them all straight. So I, I highly recommend that you use this as kind of your main way of understanding it. But there's two I'm going to use the same convention I did before where the black is going to be what is like given to you in the problem, for instance, what's like just there that's a part of the argument. And then all the stuff in green is going to be the stuff you have to think about, the stuff that maybe it's not going to be, it's not information or ideas that are going to be handed to you in the problem that you're there to evaluate, the argument that you're there to evaluate, but it's stuff that you have to think about, that you have to bring to the table in evaluating the argument that is being offered. And with an inference of best explanation, 
there are really two major moving parts here that we've got to track. So, and uh, there's some fancy words here for this stuff, but there's, um, uh, here, let's do, let's do, bleh, let's draw it like that. Um, there's what's called the, um, ex, oh shoot, the explanandum and the explanons. Splanons, am I spelling that right? I think I'm spelling that incorrectly. Oh wait, no, no, I got that right. That's right. Okay, so explanandum, explanons. I don't worry too much about this terminology. Uh, <laughs> this is like if you want to sound really fancy at dinner parties, you can talk about the explanandum and the explanons. But really, what we're talking about with the explanons is the hypothesis, the thing that is supposedly uh, doing this explanatory work for us. Um, the explanation being offered, the hypothesis that's supposed to explain. And then the explanandum, I like to just refer to this informally as the stuff to be explained. That's it. <laughs> that's the explanandum. And this might be one thing, it could be many things, we'll talk about that in a second with some examples, but the basic moving parts of, a, uh, of an explanation. Actually, you know what, I can give some more room. Let's give some more room. That's good. Okay, um, is you've got an explanons, a hypothesis, which is offering an explanation for some stuff that we want to have explained to us. So the when I had the argument before and we had some observations to be explained, that's the explanandum. The observ like this would be like uh, in my example I was using a second ago, like the fact that human beings are capable of doing math. You know, we want an explanation for that, and maybe I've got a cognitive science theory of the mind that is able to have the resources to give an explanation. Okay, so this is this is everything that you would get in a problem. But now how do we evaluate it? That's the next that's the real question here. How do we evaluate it? The first thing, um, the first standard that we're going to keep track of um, and actually you know, let's make this a little closer. So number one is what I like to call a story to tell. Um, the book talks about this as, does the, does the hypothesis in question really explain everything there is to be explained in um, the explanandum, in the stuff to be explained? So I'm going to draw this by putting these multiple arrows here to indicate that sometimes there are many things to be explained, and the hypothesis might be able to work as an explanation for one of them, or maybe two of them or something, but there might be some stuff that... It just doesn't have anything to throw out. Um, it's not even making the attempt to explain it. So let me let me give you some examples. In many in many cases, the thing we want to explain, there's just one. There's just one thing we want to explain. So in those cases, this standard is trivially passed because this standard is only relevant if there are multiple things to be explained. So keep that in mind. That's an important note, FYI. It's only relevant if there are multiple things to be explained. Hint, hint. Okay. So keep that in mind when you're doing the homework. Um, but uh, in, in many cases, there are multiple things to be explained. Here's a couple examples. Um, one of my favorite examples of inference to best explanation, and just how common it is, is when you go to the doctor. And you, you go to the doctor, and you're like, I'm sick, doctor. And they're like, OK, what are your symptoms? And you're like, OK, I got this going on, I got this going on, I got this going on. And they're like, hmm, well, maybe you've got this condition and we should do some tests to maybe confirm that um, because that condition gives rise to those symptoms so that might be the best way to explain why you have those symptoms is you have this condition so when the doctor is diagnosing you based on your symptoms they're offering an inference the best explanation they're like you might have this condition we should maybe think that it's true that you have this condition because that would explain why we're seeing the symptoms that we're seeing but let's say you go in and you're like, here are my symptoms. And the doctor's like, hmm, you know, you might have this. That would explain this and this, but it won't explain this third one that you mentioned. I, I don't know. That would be maybe something else. One thing that would make an explanation better than another explanation is if it's explaining more of the stuff to be explained than the other hypothesis. So that's something that would be a, a plus. Um, keep in mind here as we're going through all the standards, 
a good explanation doesn't necessarily meet all of the standards. Um, we'll talk about context here. I, I was just saying how like story the story to tell standard, this first thing that we're concerned about, is really only relevant when there's multiple things to be explained. Well, some of these other standards are going to be more or less relevant depending on the circumstances. Um, and something you can usually come up with counterexamples of like, well, this is an explanation that meets that standard, but it's still a bad explanation. And it might be because of how it's doing on some of the other standards. So keep in mind this is a holistic evaluation. We've got to look at all these different standards, and, and sometimes context matters. I'll, I'll mention some more cases when that's true. But with this first one, you're really just asking the question, how much of the stuff to be explained, the explanandum, is the hypothesis, the explanand, throwing, it, it's, is it even attempting? Okay. When we get into the next standard, depth, now we're going to ask, you know, how good of an explanation is that? But it, with this first standard story to tell, it's just like, is it throwing any, is it even trying? Does it have any, that's why I call it a story to tell. Does it even have a story to tell about why the stuff to be, be explained happened at all? Okay. So that's the first thing um, that we're looking for. Number two, and I'm going to draw this in a different way. Um, I'm going to put this little gap here in here, and I'm going to draw, and I'm going to, instead of using lines, I'm going to use a brush here to be like, you know, what about this? Sort of drawing a little gap here. Okay, so number two is going to be issues of depth. Okay, so what would, we want an explanation to be deep, what does it mean for an explanation to be deep? Well, if you have a deep explanation, then uh, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell you a phrase here, and this is my best definition of depth, but uh, it's a little, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, and you might have to hear it a couple times to be like, okay, yeah, this is what that's talking about. Okay, so the idea behind depth is that if it, if an explanation is deep, then that means that the explanation does not require additional explanation to see how it counts as an explanation. Okay, let me say that again. An explanation is deep if uh, it doesn't require any additional explanation in order to see how it counts as an explanation. And this is a, I put the, all those little details in there in the definition because it's important to note that depth is not a matter of just does the hypothesis raise some questions, or does the hypothesis stand in need of an explanation? So going back to our little uh, map here, you know, if I am using this hypothesis to explain this stuff to be explained, well, I, it's always possible for me to ask, well, what explains why the hypothesis is true? And I'm, now I'm making just another chain of explanation. Depth is not asking about that. It's just asking about, given this hypothesis, does it make sense that this stuff would be true? Or does it raise some questions about how this is supposed to follow from this? That just offering this as a hypothesis doesn't give me enough to see why this is supposed to happen. That's why I drew this little gap in here, that there's, there's like there's a gap. Like given this, this doesn't explain. So the way to, uh, throughout this video, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to explain to you these different standards, but then I'm also going to give you tips about how to actually uh, evaluate using this criteria. So what to look for, how to think about it, any tips and tricks I can offer. So when it comes to depth, I think this is the way to test depth in an in a explanation. Assume that the hypothesis is true. Just grant it for the sake of argument. Be like, okay, let's just say hypothesis is true. And ask yourself, if you knew the hypothesis was true, would you automatically expect this to be a result? So let me give you some examples. Um, there's some wonderful examples from the book and some, some stuff I've created over the years, too. So, um, one time I was uh, um, teaching this class, and I think this was, I think it was actually like maybe two years ago, uh, Thanksgiving two years ago, because um, it wasn't super long ago. Any, anyway, maybe it's three years. I can't remember. It's, I'm getting older. I've been doing too much teaching. Year, years all run together. Um, but one time I, I was at, at, at my um, family's house and we were goofing off and throwing the football around and it was starting to get dark and um, I jumped over a rock to catch the football and my foot landed in a divot and totally rolled it and so I was like limping, I was like walking with a cane, it was terrible. 
and I went into my class, and it was right when I was teaching Inference the Best Explanation. It was perfect timing. Um, and my students were like, Tim, why do you have a limp? Why do you have the cane? What's going on? And I was like, that sounds like an invitation for an explanation. Um, and so I, I can use this as an example. So actually, and this was this is what I actually said. Uh, and then we were able to make, and it, I wasn't planning on using it as an example for a teaching moment, but it kind of turned out that way. It's very fortuitous. Um, so they were wondering, like, why do you got the limp, Tim? And I said, I'm sorry, guys. I just had too much fun last night. That was my hypothesis. I was offering that as an explanation. I had too much fun last night. That's why I got the limp. That is not a deep explanation. And you can confirm this for yourself by um, asking yourself, okay, let's say I just believed Tim had too much fun last night. You know, or I, imagine a different context in which someone's just like, man, I had too much fun last night. Would you immediately be like, oh, so you got a limp, huh? Would you anticipate that? Would you predict limp because too much fun? No. I mean, maybe there is a path from, like, having too much fun to now resulting in the consequence of having a limp, you know, or a bad tattoo or something, you know. Maybe it's not, there's all sorts of things that could happen there. But if that's going to be a factor in determining why I have the limp, there's some other missing details to this story. There's a gap here in the explanation that needs to be filled with something else. Um, specifically, you know, after when we were talking about this, it was like, everyone laughs, ha, 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 too much fun last night. Why? Because they know it doesn't count as an explanation. It's not a very good, it's not a satisfying explanation. It doesn't settle all the questions here. Now, um, someone could ask this question. They could be like, or, 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 sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So eventually I told them the whole story. I was like, well, I, I had too much fun in the sense that uh, we were trying to have fun past the time where it was really safe to have fun because the light was going down and we couldn't really see very well anymore. Um, and that contributed to me um, having a greater likelihood uh, of ha of what happening, what, which did happen, which was that I, I rolled my ankle by putting my foot down wrong in the wrong spot. But really, I mean, if I just, if they'd asked, hey, Tim, why do you have a limp? And I said, man, I rolled my ankle really badly yesterday. That hypothesis is a deep explanation because if you find, if someone came up to you and you were like and they were like, man, I rolled my I rolled my ankle really badly last night, you'd be like, yeah, so you got a limp, and now it makes sense, right? You'd be like, yeah, you roll your ankle, probably have a limp. It's pretty reasonable to expect that. And if you if I wanted to explain why you have the limp, saying you rolled your ankle really badly, that really settles it. I mean, I don't need anything else to be able to see how that counts as an explanation. Okay, so that's great. It doesn't it it doesn't raise any other questions about how it counts as an explanation. There's plenty of other questions that could be raised here. You'd be like, why were you having too much fun last night, Tim? Why did that happen? Why did you keep playing football after the point at the, the light went down? And I could offer an explanation to that, but I don't need to offer an explanation for the explanation in order to evaluate that one explanation. Okay, that's the key point here for depth for evaluating depth. Let's use another example. I love this one from the book. It's a fantastic example. Um, I, I, it's this. It's the problem. It goes like, um, I don't see anyone in the classroom, even though we normally have class at this time in this room, because a wicked witch made them all invisible. So the stuff to be explained is why I don't see anyone in the class, even though we normally have class at this time. And the hypothesis that's being offered to explain that is a wicked witch made them all invisible. Now, this explanation is a bad explanation. And it's got a lot of problems, but depth isn't one of them. Imagine if it was true that a wicked witch made everyone invisible. Would you expect that you wouldn't be able to see them? Hell yeah, you would. That's kind of what it means for something to be invisible, that you can't see it. So the explanation is super deep. Now, does the hypothesis that a wicked witch make them all invisible raise some questions? You betcha. Right? Like, why wicked witch is turning people invisible? Why are there even wicked witch? Why should I even believe that there are wicked witches? What's going on here? Um, or that they would be interested in turning a whole classroom of students invisible? Like, there's a lot of questions that could be raised by that hypothesis, but you don't need to answer any of those questions in order to evaluate its merits as an explanation according to depth. Okay, and that's the big idea here. An explanation does not require an explanation in order to see it counting as a good explanation for whatever it's explaining. Uh, sorry, my hard drive ran out of space, so I had to um, I had to stop. I had to restart the video here. Um, so my apologies on that. Uh, what was I saying? Um, 
Uh, that was another. That's another phrase that kind of is difficult to understand. You rerun the video and, and listen to me say that a couple times. But remember, the key idea for depth is whether the explanation stands in need of an explanation to see how it counts as an explanation. That's just about this link of um, the the hypothesis to the stuff to be explained, not some other hypothesis to explain this hypothesis. Okay, so keep it here, um, and that's why I offer this strategy of saying like. Um, just the way to test depth is to grant for the sake of argument that the hypothesis is true and ask yourself whether you would expect this to happen just from that or whether there's something else that needs to be added to the story that's being told in order to have a sensible explanation for what's going on here so um, maybe this explanation gets us part of the way the hypothesis gets us part of the way to an explanation kind of like I had too much fun last night um, but it, it, if there's a gap there, if there's something else that's needed in order for me to follow the story from how, to, how we connect the dots from A to B, um, then there's a problem for depth. So that's what's going on with depth. Okay. Um, our next standard to keep track of is uh, what we're going to call power. Okay, power. That's our next stuff. And um, uh, I'm going to just put this over here other stuff. So we have the stuff that's on the table to be explained, but when it comes to power, we're interested in some other stuff. You know, there's there's some other stuff that we might be interested in having an explanation for. And maybe the hypothesis that's being offered is capable of explaining some other stuff too. Um, chances are almost any hypothesis is going to be capable of doing this to some degree, but the more the better. And this is what power is all about. Um, so in an explanation, there's always something that's like right there on the table that's already been identified to be explained. And that's like the current fish that we're frying at the moment. But in terms of evaluating how good of an explanation this is, we actually are interested in anticipating whether the hypothesis that's being offered to explain this could also be used for other cases, maybe some related cases um, or, or something like that. I'll give you some examples here. Power, power is one of the first standards that where its meaningfulness and how much it contributes to the overall explanation being a good one could change based on the context. But uh, let's go let's go back to cognitive science for a second. Um, I was mentioning how like you know a lot of times cognitive science proceeds by recognizing that human beings have a certain ability and we want an explanation for that. And so you know someone comes up with a, a model of the mind that's able to explain something, but if all of our theories of the mind were always like ad hoc built for every single different thing, then we'd get something like what happened in the uh, in the 19th century where people start speculating that there are like hundreds of faculties of the mind that are for all these different tasks. And, um, you know, especially even, they have no excuse because they had Kant back in that time anyway. Um, but if Kant was right and like the mind is all about sort of unification of experience, then maybe there's a more elegant explanation for all of this. Um, maybe I don't need to have a different hypothesis for every single cognitive ability. Maybe there's one model of how the mind works that I could be that I could use to explain a lot of different cognitive abilities. So let's say the thing that we're having a debate about right now is uh, how do we explain um, that human beings are capable of doing math? Um, what makes what makes it possible that our minds are capable of doing this? Um, if I can show that my hypothesis doesn't just explain how we're able to do math, but also how we're able to use language, that would be awesome. That'd be great to have that kind of um, powerful theory that's capable of explaining all of these different things. That would be better. That's a better explanation than one that's only able to work for this case and nothing more. Now, in the case of cognitive science, power is a big deal. In fact, it's one of the biggest things that would make a theory better than another theory in those debates. Um, but in let's go back to our case of like the uh, the um, detectives trying to explain the murder. Um, what this might look like would be like let's say the hypothesis that suspect A is the is the murderer. You know, you got a bunch of suspects, maybe this person, because the evidence, you know it's kind of consistent with their pattern, you know, or, or and maybe there's some, um, uh, oh man, I've done some silly versions of this in the past, like, uh, there's a Cheetos wrapper at the scene of the crime, and that suspect we know likes Cheetos. I mean, that, that's a very, very silly case, but 
you know, even in a more sophisticated case, this is what's going on, that there's like um, the evidence that we can observe fits with a story about this suspect being the person who is responsible for the crime. Now, this can be circumstantial evidence and there's issues here and I'm, I'm not going to get into all those cans of worms that are that are, are going to show up here. But think about it this way. If the hypothesis is something like this person, this suspect was the one who committed the crime, then power would look like something like I, this suspect being guilty in, not only explains what happened in this case, but in all these other crimes as well. I mean, it'd be to kind of turn, if we, if we were saying that every hypothesis of identifying a, a suspect, uh, if we're using IBE, inference of best explanation, uh, as our reason to believe that a suspect is guilty of a crime, if power was relevant to all of those cases, then we'd be like constantly looking for huge crime wave like answers and not all crimes are always connected with each other not every killing is a serial murder you know like sometimes it's just a one-off case you know someone did the crime and there's they it's not like they did dozens more across the city or something so depending on the context and especially depending on and we're going to talk about this a lot background assumptions about what we're talking about this might be more or less relevant notice i mentioned um, Kant's claims about unity of the mind as a background assumption for why we should maybe expect that the mind that there might be just some functions that are capable of dem uh, of explaining why we're capable of doing all sorts of different cognitive abilities. I don't need a different model of the mind for to explain how I'm capable of tying my shoes versus dealing cards or something. You know, there's there's a kind of hand-eye coordination thing going on there that. We'd expect to be similar, you know. <laughs> it's not like a whole another section of my brain for just tying my shoelaces. So, so that's a background assumption, and that plenty of crimes are not strings of crimes. Related crimes have happened. That's another background assumption that we use to decide whether power makes a big splash or a little splash in evaluating what's the best explanation here. So it can change, but that's what we're looking for with power. When it comes to the exam problem and the homework problems. Um, all I really need to see from you to, to know that you know what power is all about is that you talk to me about what kinds of related cases the hypothesis could be capable of explaining. Because pretty much every hypothesis has some degree of power. There's some other cases that it could be useful for. Um, I think there might be one pro problem in the homework that is like specifically designed to be completely ad hoc and not able to work in any other situation. So, you know, that one won't have any power, but that's kind of a, that's the book, you know, tossing you a special case to try to make a point. On the exam, I'm going to give you something that's a little more real life, and I'll just tell you right now, I mean, it's going to have some degree of power, you just need to tell me, like, what are the kinds of other things that it might be useful for explaining. Okay, that's power. Uh, number four, I'm actually going to skip for the time being. Um, number four is uh, over here. Uh, this one's a little tricky, um, so we're gonna we're gonna maybe tackle it last. Um, but it's gonna go over here. Um, the next one we'll talk about is for right now is modesty, and this one I I like to give you a little reminder on this one. Uh, overkill is the <laughs> way I like to remember modesty. Modesty, all you're doing is looking at. Um, is this hypothesis here. Oh, by the way, um, some of you might be thinking about this. Um, I always have a lot of students who are like, where's Occam's razor? Because this is, Occam's razor is a criteria of uh, evaluating explanations and what makes for a good explanation. Um, but uh, Occam's razor is actually kind of uh, embedded in a bunch of different um, standards that we have in the, in the way that I'm presenting the criteria for inference of best explanation. In many ways, power is an issue of elegance of explanation. I have one hypothesis that explains all these things for me, so I got something in my eye. Um, but modesty is another thing that um, is another one of the standards that could be maybe connected with some of your intuitions about Occam's razor, which is usually worded as something like preferring the simplest explanation. But there's some more subtlety here for how we cash that out. Um, and so this, this kind of criteria that I'm teaching you is a little more nuanced and, and, and detailed. Okay, so modesty. 
I'm looking at the explanation. If, if death, uh, there's sort of a connection here between modesty and depth. If depth is like, I didn't get enough from the hypothesis to be able to accomplish the explanation, modesty is wondering whether the hypothesis is claiming more than it needs to in order to get this explanatory work done. That's why I refer to it as overkill. Uh, there's a great uh, problem in, on, in the homework that, uh, that modesty is. So I'm letting some of the answers out of the bag here, but it's okay. There's such good examples I want to use them. Um, it says, like, the, the reason why that light in the night sky is moving so quickly is because it's this very specific flight from L.A. to Boston or something from Delta Airlines flight number, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. That's all built into the hypothesis. That's a lot of information that's not really pulling its weight in terms of explaining the stuff to be explained. The stuff to be explained here is just why the light is moving quickly. That could be explained by just saying it's an airplane. That would be a much simpler hypothesis. It doesn't claim as much, and it still does all the explanation. All these other details about, you know, that it's a delta flight, and a certain flight number, or that it's a flight from Los Angeles to Boston or whatever, it doesn't help to know why it's moving fast. Now, there might be some other stuff to be explained, like the direction it's moving in, the time of day that it's moving at, or something like that, then maybe some of that other information becomes relevant, and it's not overkill. But that's what you want to ask yourself. Uh, in testing modesty, you want to ask yourself, is there a simpler version? Could, is there a way that I could take the hypothesis, have it claim less than it is claiming, and still get the explanatory work done that needs to happen? So there's like a Goldilocks issue here between depth and modesty. The hypothesis needs to claim enough so that it doesn't have a depth issue, but it doesn't want to claim too much that it becomes immodest. Okay, so that's what we're looking for with modesty. All right, there are two more um, standards that we're going to evaluate, and I'm going to draw this little picture here. I'm making it really big intentionally because we're going to talk again about background assumptions they're gonna come back with a vengeance here in uh, inference of the best explanation and there are two standards that they're relevant to um, number six is simplicity and number seven is conservativeness oh, come on you can fit in there there we go conservativeness all right and I'm going to do some more drawing here. What's going on with both of these standards, simplicity and conservative? And by the way, oh, gosh, I moved too quickly again. There's so many cool things to talk about. I'm just looking at the clock and trying to move too quickly. Okay. Uh, one more thing to say. Remember how I was saying how power is sort of circumstantially relevant? Well, so is modesty because you can maybe already start to see that um, sometimes it's pretty hard to satisfy all of these criteria at the same time. Modesty and power, in particular, are kind of at odds with each other. Um, the more data or information you put into the hypothesis, the more robust you make its claims, the more it has the potential to be useful for explaining other things. You've got more resources at your disposal um, to explain other stuff. If I make my theory of the mind in cognitive science really complicated, well, that might be a little more than I need right now, so it's not so modest, but it might give me more power. Um, but uh, the the more that I satisfy modesty by paring down my hypothesis to just explain the stuff to be explained and nothing more, then I'm kind of cutting out how powerful it could be. And maybe sometimes this is more important than this. I think in the cop case of the detectives, modesty is more important than power. Um, but in the case of cognitive science, I think power is maybe more important than modesty um, because we're trying to put everything together. But again, context matters here. So sometimes you can't please all the standards all the time, um, and some might be more relevant than others, but that will be a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Um, simplicity and conservativeness is sort of, they have some circumstantial dependence here too, but bo both of them are going to have to do with our background assumptions. So I'm drawing this little, this big arc to indicate that there's like this huge circle of our background assumptions, of all the things that we believe are true about the world, um, our, our sort of picture of reality is our background assumptions. Sorry that that circle was so terribly drawn. Um, I didn't even really need to circle it. The background assumptions are really um, everything that we believe about how the world is. When I'm testing simplicity and conservativeness, what I'm doing is imagining what would happen 
if I brought this new hypothesis into my stock of background assumptions, what could maybe happen? What would happen if I actually endorse the hypothesis as true? What if I believe the conclusion of the argument here? What if I, I start thinking in terms of the hypothesis in how I think about the world? Well, there's a couple things that might happen that would not be ideal. With simplicity, it would be that I might, by, by believing the hypothesis, <clears throat> by endorsing it as a hypothesis in this case, that might require me to add, sorry, I want to get that to look right. It might get me to add something new to my picture of reality that I didn't have there before, or it might come into conflict, in contradiction with something that's in my background assumptions already. Um, adding something new is a problem for simplicity. Contradicting something I already believe is a problem for conservativeness. Now, I want to make some apologies immediately. Um, changing our background assumptions is sometimes something that we ought to do. In other words, um, being super conservative and not changing my mind ever is not always a good idea. But changing my mind just to change my mind is pretty worthless rationally as well. I and mean, if we're going to be critical reasoners, we need to be open to changing our mind, but changing our mind only when it's justified to change your mind. So there's still the burden of proof principle and like the code of intellectual conduct. This is kind of like fallibility burden of proof, right? Um, fallibility principle is saying you got to go into a debate open-minded. you got to recognize you might be wrong and you might need to change your mind based on the arguments that happen in that debate. That's fallibility. But burden of proof principle is saying that like any claim needs to have an argument behind it to justify why we should accept that it's true. And just because someone has an idea doesn't mean that you need to accommodate that in your background assumptions. Someone's like, you know what, people believe this, but I think that's wrong. You'd be like, yeah, I don't have anything yet to work with. If they're like, here's why I think it's wrong, here's why I think we should believe this something else, then we're like, okay, tell me more. Let's take a look at that and analyze that evidence. But um, when we're talking about inference of best explanation, we don't want to upset our background assumptions for good reason. Remember, the whole way in which inference the best explanation is trying to make an argument is citing a, a hypothesis explanatory ability as the reason to believe it's true. Just that. That's pretty meager. Hopefully, and this isn't always the case, but ideally, our stock of background assumptions about how the world works are, is on a little stronger foundation, like direct observational reports. Been like, so I've had some experiences. I've learned from those experiences. Put my hand on a hot stove. Got my hand burned. Like, that's something I know about how the world works now. I mean, that's a lot more solid than something like, you know, what would explain this would be maybe this or something. So that's the first thing to keep in mind is that. Uh, and let's let's talk about this in the context of science because science is a perfect example. And, there, and there's some really classic historical examples from the history of science that speak to simplicity and conservativeness. So imagine, um, you know, we're scientists, so we have certain theories that we accept up to this date. And then someone comes along with a different hypothesis. We're not going to just completely rewrite all the physics textbooks overnight because someone disagrees. Uh, we need some good reason for that. And if they might say, well, hey, look, this hypothesis could explain all sorts of things. If we're like, you know what, we've already got that covered. We've already got some beliefs in what we think about how the world works that allows us to explain the things that your hypothesis explains. Then there's no reason for us to add something new to our picture. We don't need to do that. If just working off of the things that we already know are true about the world, um, we're able to do this explanatory work, we don't need to come up with some new hypothesis. I don't need to explain that uh, a wicked witch turned all the students invisible in order to explain why I don't see them in the classroom. I mean, that's going to, I don't know about you, but I don't have in my worldview of how the world works wicked witches with the power to turn people invisible. Like, that's, that's, not, um, that's not a part of my worldview. So to accept that explanation requires me to add wicked witches into my picture of the universe. Um, and I think I have other ways that I can explain why I don't see anyone in the classroom um, without having to add something totally new. Um, but sometimes this is correct. Let me give you an explanation of, uh, or uh, an example from, that's um, kind of on the cutting edge of, of science today. Um, some of you may have heard of string theory before. String theory is an extremely controversial uh, 
thesis, or I mean, it's a whole theoretical structure at this point, a uh, pretty complicated one too. In fact, not every there's I think there's maybe only three people in the world that can do all the calculations that are all the math that's behind um, string theory. But anyway, I, don't quote me on that. I could be wrong about that. I remember reading that somewhere. I think um, I'm a philosopher, not a scientist, but I do also do some science stuff. Anyway, <laughs> not enough apologies. Um, string theory is a way of trying to explain a lot of things about subatomic physics that we can observe that seems a little strange. Um, and what string theory is saying is that basically there aren't different types of fundamental particles in the universe. I mean, that's kind of how we normally think about them. Electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks, all this different stuff. Um, Higgs bosons and stuff like that. String theory is saying they're actually, everything is the same. Matter is matter. There's only one type of matter, and it's a string. And the only reason why um, these particles behave in different ways is that they are strings that are vibrating at different frequencies of energy. They're at different energy levels. So basically, the string theorist is saying everything in the world is made up of tiny strings that are vibrating. And the more energy, the more vibration, right? And the more energy, the more that particle, uh, the string, is going to behave differently um, than other particles. And when we've got these uh, particle colliders where we're discovering new subatomic particles. And the string theorist has a ready explanation for that. They're like, well, we're making more powerful particle colliders. In other words, we're able to, when we throw two particles at each other and we speed them up really fast and then toss them at each other and they hit each other, um, that's a lot higher energy level than we've been able to create before. So you'd expect to see different types, of, or you'd, be able, you'd expect to see subatomic particles that are behaving differently than other ones that we've observed before um, because the strings are just vibrating at a different level. That's how they explain it. Okay, it's not that there are different particles, It's ultimately. It's just that there are strings that are vibrating at different frequencies um, because of different energy levels. So that's what the string theorist is saying. Like I said, this is a very controversial theory in physics because we never have been able to see a string. You can't observe a string directly. It's impossible to do that. This is purely a theoretical object that people have speculated and said, like, maybe strings. Maybe that explains it. It's really a big inference, the best explanation. Now, it's got a lot of support in, the mu in as much as uh, string theory also is accompanied with a whole lot of mathematical modeling that does a pretty good job of capturing the things that we observe. But it's still an inference, the best explanation. And the reason why it's so controversial is that there are a lot of scientists who think, you know, the explanatory work that string theory can do for us, I think we can do without positing this totally new type of thing, strings, which exist, that exist in this really um, different way than how we've thought about the world before. So that's like, they don't want to add a new theoretical object to our understanding of the world, the positing these strings that are present. Um, they, you're like, we can get all the work done without that. Um, so that's an example of simplicity. We want to avoid adding something if we can. If we can, if we can't, then we can't, and then too bad. And this is like a case where um, uh, there's no explanation to offer. Like where we make more powerful telescopes or microscopes, we're able to see things and observe things that we weren't able to observe before. And maybe all of our existing theories just don't give an explanation for it. Then we got to come up with some new things, some new ideas to explain it. So then then we're going to tolerate adding something new to our background assumptions. We're learning something more. We're you know, seeing more of how the universe is. Um, but if we can give an explanation based on things we are already accept without having to add anything new to our picture of the universe, then that would be a better explanation. So that's what's going on with simplicity. With conservativeness, it's basically a similar idea here of not wanting to have to change our background assumptions. But this is a more extreme case. This is a case where the hypothesis is in direct conflict. It's in logical contradiction. Or tension with the beliefs that we already have. And one of my favorite examples of conservativeness in the history of science is Copernicus. So maybe you've heard of Copernicus. Copernicus argued that it wasn't that the sun traveled around the earth, it was that the earth is traveling around the sun. And his arguments for this were how to explain the motion of the stars in the heavens. The models that had the sun traveling around the earth uh, maybe you've seen these Astrolabs and all these like really elaborate archaic modeling that people made. Like you've got the Earth at the center and then all these really weird moving parts to try to capture all the motions of the stars. And um, Copernicus was like, that's a really complicated theory. 
I think I can simplify this. If we just switch this one element, if we're like, okay, maybe instead of the sun traveling around the earth, it's the earth traveling around the sun. Now, all of a sudden, all of the motion of the stars you can track in a really elegant system, and it makes so much sense. Okay, so he was appealing to these other virtues of a good explanation that his hypothesis that the earth travels around the sun uh, was um, a better way to explain why the stars move in the heavens the way that they do, that they have the pattern of movement that they do. Copernicus was uh, famously challenged uh, and um, ridiculed and stuff for his for his uh, scientific hypothesis. Um, but th there's, there's actually a rational reason for it, that we don't want to give up our beliefs that we have on independent, maybe more solid grounds, just to accommodate something's explanatory power. Now, in the case of Copernicus, you know, there's maybe enough other, uh, of, there maybe I've, Copernicus was mistreated in the sense that there really is a solid argument here for arguing that his explanation is a better explanation than our pre-existing beliefs. And certainly a lot of people laughed him off without ever taking him really seriously of like measuring his proposal in this sort of even-handed way. Um, certainly dogmatism is something that happens in science as much as it happens in other sectors of our world like religion or politics or culture and stuff like that. It happens in scientific communities too. It happens in philosophical communities for gosh sakes. You know, and we're trying to be critical thinkers as much as possible. So this is a, a tendency and I think that happened in the Copernicus case. But um, there Sorry, it cut out again. I, I thought I had a couple more minutes left before the hard drive was full. But um, let me, so I was saying um, there is a rational reason for for the conservativeness um, standard here in inference of the best explanation. That if I've again on the same principle with simplicity, if I've got a an explanation that's just as good as this new one, um, but that doesn't require me to change my background assumptions of how the world is that is presumably backed up with other evidence, then that's that's something I'm going to do. I'm going to hang on to that um, rather than just changing everything in order to explain this one thing that's right in front of me. Now again, the relative merit and value of these um, standards could maybe increase or decrease based on the context. Like in the case of Copernicus, I think the other, the fact that the explanation is doing so well on the on these other standards is enough to overlook the fact that it's requiring this one change in our beliefs. I mean, there's a lot that you get from that by changing that. And really, the only reason to think that the sun travels around the Earth might be this basic perception. And there's other cases about relativity of perception that people could have been thinking in terms of in order to figure that out. Um, so there's not a lot backing up the idea that the 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 sun must travel around the earth. So um, that's part of the context of those background assumptions that would be relevant here. But if I got background assumptions that are backed up with more direct evidence, um, and then I, an explanation is asking me to go against those, then that's going to be a little surprising to me. Like, um, let's say I'm good friends with you, and um, and you do something, and uh, you, you do an action, and I'm trying to explain it, and I'm like, oh, they said... They said that thing that hurt my feelings because um, they're really trying to ruin my day. I'm like, wait, that doesn't make sense because I got a lot of beliefs about what that person is like. They're my friend. They wouldn't do things like that. So I'm not going to I'm not going to accept that explanation if I've got some other explanation that could do a better job. Okay, uh, I am running out of time on the hard drive, so uh, we're going to have to leave this last standard for the next video. But that's okay because the next video is going to be shorter, so we'll even it out a little bit more. But there's that's um, that's six of the seven standards for inference of best explanation. So I'll see you next time to finish it off, and then we'll do uh, argument from analogy. So and then we'll be done with this section. So.